Check out these cool on. Oh, hold on. Check out these cool Ontario coasters I got. Aren't these neat? If you walk through Durand, you'll primarily see two styles of buildings. You see tall apartments sandwiched between Victoria era mansions. If Brad Lamb gets his way, you can see both on the same building. <coughs> but near City Hall, there's this one group of houses centered around Wesenford Place. Amongst all these towers are these 1930s style cottages. The history of this block is filled with tragedy, political intrigue, affairs, and even incest. Welcome to Wesenford Manor. All right, we don't have time to do the whole intro. This video is long enough as it is. Wesenford was a 56 room manor estate located on Caroline Street between Jackson and Hunter. It was named in 1892 by its owner, Senator William Eli Sanford. Wait a minute. William Eli Sanford. W.E. Sanford. Wesenford. I get it now. I get it now. Okay. William was born in the 1830s in Manhattan. When he was just six years old, he was orphaned and sent to live with his auntie and uncle in Hamilton. Now this is a story all about how my life got flipped, turned upside down. His uncle was Edward Jackson, whom Jackson Street is named after today. William ended up marrying his cousin, which is pretty uncomfortable at the best of times, but also remember that he was raised by his aunt and uncle. He married his adopted sister, which is like double plus gross. Oh. Ugh. 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 They were only married for 18 months, though, because uh, she died in childbirth and uh and the child also died a couple months later so uh look i told you guys this was going to be a bit of a tragedy so in the 1800s most clothes were either made at home or by tailors sanford got in very early on ready-to-wear clothes that were apparently both the cheapest and also the best his company grew really quickly within 10 years he had 455 employees they were the largest tailor in all of ontario by comparison, Hamilton's second largest tailor only employed 15 people. They were the fourth largest employer in the entire province. He built a factory to house all of his employees. Look at this factory. Look at how fancy this factory is. He was called the Wool King of Canada, and while there aren't any official records, it's likely that he was the richest man in the entire country. In 1866, he married his second wife, and the first one that he wasn't related to, Harriet Sophia Vox. Vox? Vo? I don't know. I'm not sure how to pronounce it. Sophia was a woman 16 years his junior, and they ended up having four children. In the 1870s, he started butting heads with Canada's second prime minister, Sir John Abbott. Now, the ruling liberals, they refused to raise import tariffs on British wool, so it was making it hard for him to make an even bigger profit. He got together with George Tuckett, and you can probably recognize his house as the Scottish Rite, and they threw their support behind Sir John A. Macdonald and the Conservative Party with their national policy. Oh, and by the way, Canada's second prime minister wasn't John Abbott. It was Alexander Mackenzie. But I bet you didn't know that. Shame on you. Learn your Canadian history. And he didn't look like this. He looked like this. Gotcha. That's John Thompson, our fifth prime minister. This is what Alexander Mackenzie looked like. Or is it? You'll never know. Nah, it is. Do you think we'll ever get a prime minister that looks quite this homely ever again? Sir John A. Macdonald's conservatives returned to power in 1878. He quickly raised taxes on British imports and Sanford's business exploded. He quadrupled his workforce, over 2,000 employees now. He also began operating retail stores to sell his goods. They were called Oak Hall. Oak Hall had locations all across the country, but one of the first stores was right here in Hamilton. This block was redone a couple years ago, but as recently as 2019, you could still see the Oak Hall lettering on the brick. When Sanford's aunt died in 1875, he inherited the family home and quickly got to work on expanding it. Here it is following the first expansion in 1877, and following the second expansion in 1892. The final house was massive. Four stories, a tower, 56 rooms, electric elevators, automatic gas lighters on all the fireplaces, a telephone system that connected every room in the house. 
every chandelier worked with both gas and electricity. There was a two-story dining room, a pipe organ, seven greenhouses, and a stables. The insurance maps from this era showed just how big the house and outbuildings were, and this photo of the construction of the Hunter Street Tunnel shows them in the background. That spire is on the stables. When William's son Jackson got married, they threw a party with a thousand attendees in this place. When it was revealed, the Hamilton Spectator described it as the finest house in the Dominion. Now, Sanford was fabulously wealthy, but building a house like this costs a lot of money. To help pay for it, he simply cut the wages of all of his employees by 10% across the board. Nice and easy. A couple months later, he, uh, he threatened to cut their wages again, so the workers threatened to go on strike, and Sanford, thankfully, relented. Hey, remember how I said he threw his support behind Sir John A. Macdonald? Well, Sir John A. Macdonald wanted to show his thanks, so he gave Sanford a seat in the Senate and also a near monopoly on all of the uniform contracts for the Canadian military. The Liberal Party was furious. There were allegations of collusion and price fixing. One of the most ardent critics was a Liberal MP named James Somerville. But here's the weird thing. I can't tell you which James Somerville it was. There were two Liberal MPs elected in the same year with the exact same name. One of them represented Brant and the other one represented Bruce. In addition to that, after Sir John A. passed away, Sanford commissioned the statue of him that stands in Gore Park. Well, stood in Gore Park. Despite his incredible wealth, there was one thing money couldn't buy Sanford. A knighthood. He basically tried to bribe our Governor General, the Earl of Aberdeen, into giving him a knighthood. Everything from gifts, to fruit baskets, to using his cottage in Muskoka. Fruit it's It's one of the things that is explicitly mentioned. <laughs> I know, right? With everything. Uh, I, yeah. I guess maybe fruit was fancier. But I, maybe, but... yeah. Like, people love pineapple. The governor general's wife hated him, though. We have access to her diaries, and she did not like Sanford. He was viewed as baseborn, and he was looked down upon for being an orphan of all things. And like, while lots of rich men of the day would have affairs, Sanford didn't even really try to hide his, which was really frowned upon. Sanford really had a soft spot for kids and orphans, you know, in the there but for the grace of God go I kind of way. He was very involved with the home children, which, while today it has a fairly terrible legacy, uh, Sanford would always follow up on the kids, and if they were in abusive situations, remove them from those households and get them work in his factory. And yeah, you know, having kids work in a factory isn't the greatest thing in the world, but, you know, he was a product of his time. He also built this absolutely gorgeous convalescent home for sick children on the beachfront. He and his family funded it for 30 full years. William Eli Sanford died doing what he loved, being far away from his wife. He was stricken with rheumatism while on a boat with a young female companion and fell overboard. His wife Harriet continued to own Wesenford for a full 40 years, although she never really spent much time there afterwards. When she died at the age of 90, the house was quickly sold, the contents auctioned off, and was demolished soon after, replaced by these houses. The Spectator described it as the most luxurious and fully furnished Victorian house on the North American continent. So, is there anything left of this incredible building? Well, not really. There's this retaining wall off of Jackson Street. Many of the houses have pieces of fencing as railings. And a viewer was kind enough to show me this photo of their fireplace, which they suspect has details from the original house. Compare it to this photo of Wesenford's interior. Sanford commissioned many buildings throughout his life. For a time, his buildings helped define Hamilton. Now they're almost all gone. Wesenford has been replaced. His factory is now part of the Royal Connaught. Elsinore has disappeared from the beachfront. Even the statue of Sir John A. Macdonald is gone. In fact, the only building he commissioned that remains is this one. I've seen a lot of people online lamenting the loss of this building. Wouldn't it be nice to have another gem like Dundurn? Or Whitehern? 
but I think we'd be just as likely to have another Akmar or Century Manor on our hands here. I don't really lament the loss of an extravagant building like this, especially one replaced by so many beautiful houses. I just love looking at these examples of faded Hamilton. Is this bit getting old yet? <laughs>